Joining me on the program today is Inga Frickland, a former prosecutor and an executive board member of Law Enforcement Against Prohibition, which is a nonprofit group of criminal justice professionals working to end the war on drugs. Uh, it's so great to speak to you. And we, we actually have something newsworthy to discuss here, which is that Canada has taken some major steps to end the war on heroin users. And we've been hearing so much about legislation and lobbying related to marijuana, particularly in the US. But this is really very major news. Let's start there. What exactly has Canada done? Well, Canada has changed its Controlled Substances Act so that it's possible for a physician in a controlled setting to supply pharmaceutical grade injectable heroin to an addict for whom no other treatment has worked. It has to be done in a controlled setting. And it seems to be, uh, you know, fairly tightly circumscribed to make sure that it's all everything is signed off and it is in a medical setting and when we talk about one of the main sort of impediments in the united states anyway to when it comes to marijuana loosening laws we often encounter this sort of vicious circle which is oh politicians say i'm open to loosening the laws as soon as we have more research but of course the research is difficult to do because the laws are so tight has Canada experienced a sort of similar dynamic with heroin? Uh, there does. I, I don't know if it's the research is prohibited in the same way that it is here, but it's difficult. In reading some of the legislative history on this new act, it refers to a couple of studies that had been done. And they also looked at European experience, which of course has done research for a long time. Um, so it's it's primarily the United States that takes this very emotional and restrictive attitude toward even gaining knowledge about drugs. It's a more put our head in the sands and pretend the problem doesn't exist. When did you start to, I don't know if realize is the right word, but to really become increasingly concerned with the futility of the war on drugs in the US? I know that you worked as a prosecutor in Cook County and and you I've read that you've started to see the sort of racially disproportionate way in which the war on drugs was impacting people. But give us a sense of of sort of your involvement directly in the war on drugs and how your views started to change. This was back in the mid 1980s when I was a young prosecutor in Chicago. I spent a lot of time being assigned to the bond courts where people would come in usually in the middle of the night when they were first arrested. And I would look at the rap sheets, uh, you know, sometimes could be page after page of minor arrests and convictions, mostly for drugs. And then the new arrest would also be something drug related. Hmm. I also noticed that a lot of the more serious cases, including murders, it turned out to be a fight over some drug territory. So it looked like drugs were driving a lot of our caseload. And at first I didn't give a whole lot of thought to it because I thought, hey, drugs are illegal, drugs are bad, these people were doing drugs, so we'll convict them. But it maybe it was kind of like water dripping. It gradually sank in. First of all, I noticed that almost, almost without exception, the defendants were black. Hmm. Few Hispanics, virtually no whites. And even though we know that uh, usage of drugs is pretty similar across racial groups, uh, the drug laws were clearly falling much more heavily for some reason on m minority communities. Second thing that got me thinking is that given the restrictions that many employers have, uh, somebody with a rap sheet like this is never going to get a job in the legitimate economy. Hmm. So essentially our convictions weren't solving whatever we thought the problem was, but it was digging people deeper into the drug economy. We made it so that they would never be able to get out. And sure enough, I would see these repeat customers, uh, same people showing up week after week. We'd send them out, they went back to dealing drugs since that was probably their only option. 
And if they survived getting shot in the middle of some turf warfare, uh, they'd be back again. So it looked as though we were locked almost in this dance, that the prosecution, we did the same thing day after day, they did the same thing day after day, and nothing changed. No, did except you, for things. Um, did you worse. see, were there any particular cases that stood out to you where you said, you know, the big picture of this just makes absolutely no sense whatsoever, aside from the sort of generalities that you talked about? Were there specific cases that really impacted you? I, I can't think of, there was such a similarity to the cases that especially the ones involving marijuana, nothing really stood out. It, it, if anything, it was the sameness of it hmm. that got to me. Yeah. You know, these, the defendants were becoming this undifferentiated mass that were treated you know, with no interest or respect from the prosecution that we just kept cycling through kind of mass production. Yeah. That, that steady drip, drip, drip. And then after I spent time in the prosecutor's office, then I moved on to doing some other things uh, and didn't give the matter a whole lot more thought. Well, one of and those then, other things it, that's fascinating to me is the time you spent in Helmand province in Afghanistan, which when we think about well, the war on drugs in the U.S., maybe for some of us, we see a connection to what's going on in Afghanistan. But but many people maybe don't see that. I'd love to hear a little bit about that. Oh, well, my, my thoughts really started to crystallize beginning in 2004 when I first went to Afghanistan with uh, the U.S. Agency for International Development. Uh, and between 2004 and 2014, I've been on the ground in Afghanistan for just about five years. Hmm. So I have seen kind of the course of the war and how much worse and worse it's gone and what's happening with drugs. Uh, early on, one of the things I remember is meetings at the U.S. Embassy of what agriculture programs could be developed to try to get uh, Afghan farmers to grow something other than poppy. Right. And at one meeting at the embassy, I said, uh, have we considered just legalizing drugs? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the answer that I got was, that is not U.S. government policy, and you had better not bring it up again. But it really gets to the heart of this issue, right? Which is that we are creating so much of what we claim to want to fix around the world by virtue of our drug policy in the United States. Yes, and the whole poppy production in Afghanistan is driven by demand, actually more in Western Europe and Russia than in the U.S. We get ours from South and Central America. But the, the U.S. government there was treating it as a supply pro problem. Right. If, if we can only convince uh, African farmers to grow wheat, which pays them a twentieth as much. But one of the things that struck me about that conversation, and something which very much bothers me about the whole war on drugs, is the intellectual dishonesty of it. If we're going to say it's our policy to have um, opium poppy be illegal, let's also take into consideration what are the inevitable consequences of that. There is going to be violence and corruption within Afghanistan. Now, we can't pretend that this war on drugs is costless. And yeah. the, the intellectual dishonesty of being unwilling to apply some logical analysis to the problem just like the intellectual dishonesty of having marijuana be Schedule One, You know, the legal definition is highly addictive and no known medical use. Well, that's simply counterfactual. You know, I'm not one of the, the types that relies and points to the free market in all cases. In fact, quite the opposite. But I'm also just stunned when we ignore the fact, like in the example you gave of, hey, Let's just convince these Afghani farmers to grow wheat instead of instead of opium, instead of poppy. Um, well, that ignores the market realities. And, and sometimes we actually do have to pay attention to them, don't we? Oh, absolutely. And I, re I remember once uh, when I was 
living out at a small military base in eastern Afghanistan, which now seems to be ISIS territory. Uh, some young staffer from the embassy flew out from Kabul to give us all the word on the latest uh, plans for the war on drugs. And I remember him saying, those greedy Afghan farmers, they would survive if they just grew wheat. But they want the money from the heroin. And when we are talking about Afghan farmers living in mud brick villages, statistically a quarter of their children are going to die before the age of five. And we're talking about them being greedy. I, I just found that so offensive. Yeah, no, it doesn't make sense uh, yeah. on many, many levels. Uh, I wish we had more time. We have been speaking with Inga Frickland, former prosecutor and executive board member for law enforcement against prohibition. Uh, thanks so much for talking to us both about what's happening in Canada with heroin, but also your experience. Absolutely fascinating. It has been. Well, thanks for having me on.